the matter I'm calling is D101CR202413, State of New Mexico versus Alexander Ray Baldwin. All right, jury. What are you doing? Oh, I have it on. So, I have already sworn you in, if you'll recall, yesterday. Okay. And now I'm going to explain some trial procedure. First of all, I want you to know we, this trial is being filmed, but you are not being filmed, and you will not be filmed at all throughout the within the courtroom, okay? All right. So I'm going to, um, this is a criminal case, as you know. I'm going to reread the grand jury indictment. It's, um, it's very formal, so we'll go with that. Count one, involuntary manslaughter, negligent use of a firearm, in that honor about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, State of New Mexico at Bonanza Creek Ranch, located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe NM 87508. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins in the commission of negligent use of a firearm. Uh, count two in the count one in the alternative, involuntary manslaughter without due caution or circumspection in that on or about October 21, 2021 in Santa Fe County, State of New Mexico at Bonanza Creek Ranch, located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87507. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins by an act committed with the total disregard or indifference for the safety of others and the act was such that an ordinary person would anticipate that death might occur under the circumstances. Again, Mr. Baldwin is presumed innocent. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. What I say now is the introduction of uh, the case and the instructions. All right. Along with the, those instructions previously given, these are preliminary only and may be changed during or at the end of trial. First of all, all of you must pay close attention to the evidence. After you've heard all of the evidence in the case, I will read the final instructions of law to you. You will also receive a written copy of the instructions. You must follow the final instructions in deciding this case. And just so you know, there's going to be no transcript available to you. Juries have asked me that, so I'm telling you up front, okay? Again, the trial is expected to last eight days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week. That's the trial that does not include your deliberation time. The usual hours of trial will be from 8.30 to 5, typically, uh, with a half hour for lunch. No, an hour for lunch. And then um, a morning break and an afternoon break. Again, please report to the jury lounge no later than 8.30, unless uh, we're instructing you otherwise for different reasons. But in your mind, you can always expect 8.30 to be here, okay? Do not come into the courtroom unless you are accompanied by my bailiff, Steve, okay? You may take water into the courtroom with you, and you can also take um, coffee or tea or, uh, um, if you have a lid on your um, cup, okay? We stand up out of respect for you because you are the ultimate decision makers as to the facts in this particular case. So when you come into the courtroom, you can go ahead and be seated, and then we will take our seats. And again, it's important to hear. So please raise your hand at any time you can't hear. Don't be self-conscious about it. Don't wait until a couple of questions have been asked. You've got to, if you can't hear, you've got to shoot that hand up right away, okay? All right, this is a public proceeding, so people may go in and out. You may find yourself looking at who goes in and out, but after a while, you'll get used to it. But if there is anything that is distracting you from being able to listen and be involved in this case, please tell Steve immediately. He'll let me know, and I'll do my best to get rid of the distraction. As you know, the temperature we cannot control. All right, so sorry, we'll try to get the county in here if it um, plummets too high. I doubt it'll plummet too low. 
You are allowed but not required to take notes during trial. Uh, Steve has given you a, a, ped, uh, a pad and a pen. Uh, Pen? Okay. Uh, please put your name on the front page of your pad and then take notes beginning on the second page. On breaks, uh, follow Steve's instruction on whether to take the uh, pad with you or whether to leave it on, on your chair. You don't have to worry about confidentiality. They'll be locked up at night and, um, and when the trial is finished, they'll be shredded. Okay. okay. Uh, don't let your notes take the place of your independent memory of the evidence. When taking notes, please do not forget to pay close attention to the trial. Listening and watching witnesses during their testimony will help you assess their appearance, behavior, memory, and whatever else bears on their credibility. Let's go through the order of trial for those that have uh, uh, not engaged in a criminal trial before. A criminal trial generally begins with the lawyers telling you what they expect the evidence to show. These statements and the statements made by the lawyers during the course of the trial can be of considerable assistance to you in understanding the evidence as it is presented at trial. Is there something distracting you, Juror? No. I'm talking to the other one. Okay. Statements of the lawyers, however, are not themselves evidence. The evidence will be the testimony of the witnesses, exhibits, and any facts agreed to by the parties. After you have heard all of the evidence, I will give you final instructions on the law. The lawyers will argue the case, and then you will retire to the jury room to arrive at a verdict. It is my duty to decide what evidence you may consider. Your job is to find and determine the facts in this case, which you must do solely upon the evidence received here in court. It is the duty of a lawyer to object to questions, testimony, or exhibits the lawyer believes may not be proper, and you must not hold such objection against the objecting party. I will sustain objections if the question or evidence sought is improper for you to consider. If I sustain an objection to evidence, you must not consider such evidence, nor may you consider any evidence I have told you to disregard. By itself, a question is not evidence. You must not speculate about what would be the answer to a question that I rule cannot be answered. It is for you to decide whether the witnesses know what they are talking about and whether they are being truthful. You may give the testimony of any witness whatever weight you believe it merits. You may take into account, among other things, the witness's ability and opportunities to observe memory, manner, or any bias or prejudice that the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the testimony considered in light of all of the evidence of the case. No ruling, gesture, or comment I make during the course of the trial should influence your decision in this case. At times, I may ask questions of witnesses. If I do, such questions do not in any way indicate my opinion about the facts or indicate the weight I feel you should give to the testimony of the witnesses. Questions by jurors. Ordinarily, the attorneys will develop all pertinent evidence. It is the exception rather than the rule that an individual juror will have an unanswered question after all of the evidence is presented. However, if you feel an important question has not been asked or answered, write it down on a piece of your note paper and give it to Steve before the wit before this is important before the witness leaves the stand. Okay? I will decide whether or when your question will be asked. Rules of evidence or other considerations apply to questions you submit and may prevent the question from being asked. If the question is not asked, please do not give it any further consideration. Do not discuss it with the other jurors. And please do not hold it against either side that you did not get an answer. Conduct of jurors. Again, very important. You must decide the case solely upon the evidence received here in court. You must not consider anything you may have read or heard about the case outside the courtroom. During the trial in your deliberations, you must avoid news accounts of the trial, whether they be on radio, television, the internet, or in a newspaper or other written publication. You must not visit the scene of the incident on your own. You, can ma you cannot make experiments re with reference to the case, and in this day and age, you cannot Google or research any of the subject matter of this case. Until you retire to deliberate the case, you must not discuss this case or the evidence with anyone, including each other. Very important, as I said yesterday, when you go in that room, 
You don't, you don't talk about the case. You wait until you are a jury that is deliberating, okay? If an exhibit is admitted in evidence, you should examine it yourself and not talk about it with other jurors until you retire to deliberate. It is important that you keep an open mind and not decide any part of the case until the entire case has been completed and submitted to you. Your special responsibility as jurors demands that throughout this trial, you exercise your judgment impartially and without regard to any sympathy, bias, or prejudice. To minimize the risk of accidentally overhearing something that is not evidence in this case, please continue to wear your jurors' badges while in and around the courthouse. If someone happens to discuss the case in your presence, report that fact immediately to Steve. Although it is natural to visit with people you meet, please do not talk with any of the attorneys, parties, witnesses, or spectators either in or out of the courtroom. If you meet in the hallways or elevators, there's nothing wrong with saying a good morning or a good afternoon, but your conversation should end there. If the attorneys, parties, and witnesses do not greet you outside of court, or avoid riding in the same elevator with you, they are not being rude, they are just carefully observing. All right, so uh, we're going to begin the case. The case starts with opening statements. The state begins first because they have the burden of proof and then the defendant. All right, go ahead, counsel. <laughs> Judge, just one quick housekeeping matter while Ms. Uh, uh, Johnson's getting set up. All right. Thank you. Good morning. When someone plays make-believe with a real gun in a real-life workplace, and while playing make-believe with that gun violates the cardinal rules of firearm safety, people's lives are endangered and someone could be killed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what this case is about. It's simple, it's straightforward. The evidence will show that someone who played make-believe with a real gun and violated the cardinal rules of firearm safety is the defendant, Alexander Baldwin. You will hear over the course of the next few days that in the fall of 2021, a movie called Rust began filming at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, just south of Santa Fe, in Santa Fe County. You will learn that this movie was a Western with a lot of gun action. And while it was a movie set, it was a real life workplace for many people. But you will hear this workplace was on a tight budget. And you will learn that some of the people who were hired to work at this workplace were very inexperienced. And one of those was the armorer, 
a very young woman named Hannah Gutierrez Reed. You will hear testimony from crew members who worked on the set who will tell you that to them, Ms. Gutierrez's inexperience was obvious. You will also learn that this workplace has some talented people. And one of those was the director of photography, a vibrant 42-year-old rising star named Helena Hutchins. You will also learn that the director of this film was Joel Souza, another talented individual who cares deeply for his projects. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that like in many workplaces, there are people who act in a reckless manner and place other individuals in danger and act without due regard for the safety of others. That, you will hear, was the defendant, Alexander Baldwin, the lead actor on this film. You will learn that this movie began filming on or about October 6, 2021. But the defendant did not arrive on set to begin working until about October 13. And you will learn that prior to arriving on the set to work, he requested to be assigned the biggest gun available. So he was assigned this revolver a replica of an 1873 single action revolver manufactured by Pieta Firearms in Italy. You will hear from Alessandro Pieta, who will tell you he manufactured this gun. And he will tell you he manufactured it in 2015. And he will explain the quality control measures that Pieta Firearms follows in order to ensure that firearms that are manufactured by Pieta Firearms don't have any problems or issues. Mr. Pieta will tell you that this firearm he himself manufactured and that when Pieta sent it to EMF, which is the company that distributes firearms for Pieta Firearms in the United States, this gun was in perfect working condition. You will hear from Justin Neal, who is a representative of EMS, EMF, excuse me, a company out of California that has historically been known to provide firearms to the movie industry. Mr. Neal will tell you that when EMF received this firearm in 2017, it was in perfect working order. And in fact, when EMF had this firearm, it was subjected to numerous quality control inspections because it was used as a show gun at gun shows. The evidence will show that in September of 2021, an individual by the name of Seth Kenny was contacted by the folks with Russ Production. They asked Mr. Kenny if he, was, he would be able to provide some firearms for the filming for use during the filming of Rust. You will learn that Mr. Kenny owns PDQ Firearm and Prop. It's a duly licensed firearms dealership. Mr. Kenny then contacted EMF and ordered several single action replica revolvers. And in September or on September 29, 2021, Mr. Kenny purchased this gun. And you will hear that Mr. Kenny received it from EMF and it was in perfect working order. The only thing that Mr. Kenny did to this gun was to insert the firing pin because since it was a show gun, it didn't have a firing pin. But you'll learn that that's a very easy step. All he had to do was just insert the pin and that's it. And then Mr. Kenny had the firearms, this one and some other firearms, transferred to the set of rust at the Bonanza Creek Ranch. And on October 13, 2021, the defendant was supposed to have a training session with this gun and this young armor. But you will see 
that during this training session, the defendant had somebody or a couple of people filming him while he's running around shooting this gun. You will learn, ladies and gentlemen, or you'll hear during this trial the use of the words prop gun. And you'll learn a prop gun is this real gun. It's not a toy. It's not made of rubber. It's a real gun. You will also see evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that during the days before that fateful October 21st day, the defendant handled this firearm multiple occasions. You will see video footage of the defendant firing this firearm, working perfectly fine. But you'll see evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that each time the defendant handled this firearm, he did not do a safety check with that inexperienced armorer. And you'll hear that the reason he didn't do a safety check is because he didn't want to offend her. The evidence you will see will paint a real life picture of a real life workplace where this defendant mishandled this gun. You will see him using this gun as a pointer to point at people, to point at things. You will see him cock the hammer when he's not supposed to cock the hammer. You will see him put his finger on the trigger when his finger's not supposed to be on the trigger. You will hear about numerous breaches of firearm safety with this defendant and this use of this firearm. And the evidence will show that on the morning of October 21st, 2021, the camera crew walked off set. And you will learn that one of the reasons that camera crew walked out is because they were concerned over safety breaches with the use of firearms. The evidence will show that the morning of October 21st started out a couple of hours behind. They filmed some scenes at this church on the Bonanza Creek Ranch. And you will see that one of those scenes required the defendant to pull out his gun. This was in the morning. Pull out his gun, and you'll hear the director tell him, pull it out and hold it. And the first time, you'll see evidence the defendant does what the director tells him. But you're, you will hear the director tell you that many times the defendant would do his own thing. So then the director in the morning asked him, okay, do it again, just like you did now. The defendant pulls out the gun, but this time he cocks the hammer. The evidence will show they then broke for lunch. And at around 1.30 or so, they came back to this church to do what's called a blocking. The evidence will show that Ms. Hutchins wanted to do a blocking for an insert. And you will learn what a blocking is, just working out the details of the moves of the actor. It wasn't even a rehearsal. You will hear from one of the witnesses who walked into the church and saw the defendant kind of playing with his gun. And then you will see evidence or hear evidence that Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza were talking to the defendant about doing this insert. And the insert was just supposed to be from here to here. And it was supposed to be of the defendant just slowly taking his gun out of this holster, out of his holster, and just holding it at an angle. The evidence will show that someone asked the armorer to bring the defendant's gun to him. And she did. She brought it into the church, showed it to David Halls, who you will learn is, was the first assistant director. The gun was empty. Ms. Gutierrez then handed the gun to the defendant. But then you will hear that Ms. Gutierrez was given the gun back and she took it and loaded it with dummy rounds. And what you will learn is that dummy rounds are inert rounds. They look like real 
real rounds, but they are very easy to tell that they are not because they'll rattle. Ms. Gutierrez then went back to the church, showed the revolver to the first assistant director very fast. They only checked about three rounds, very quick. And they missed one round. You will learn that one of the rounds in that revolver was a real round. And the evidence will show that Ms. Gutierrez then handed the gun to the defendant. And what you will learn is that once again, the defendant failed to do a gun check or a safety check with this armor. So he takes the firearm, puts it in his holster. Then Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza were doing this blocking. And the evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that the defendant, again, did his own thing. You will hear from an individual by the name of Kent Jorgensen. Mr. Jorgensen will tell you that he's been involved in drafting and revising movie set safety rules. You will learn that these movie set safety rules require actors like the defendant to treat every firearm as though it's loaded, to never point a firearm at another person, and to never put your finger on the trigger unless you're prepared to shoot or to destroy whatever's in front of you. The evidence will show that on October 21st, 2021, after that lunch break, the defendant once again violated those set safety rules. And during this blocking, the director had instructed him to just slowly take out that gun and just hold it at an angle. But you will see that the defendant takes it out quickly the first time, points it. And you will hear witness testimony who will tell you the first time he does it, his finger is on or around the trigger. He does it again, takes it out very fast, points it, and once again, you will hear testimony that his finger was on or around the trigger. And the evidence will show that that third and fatal time, he takes it out once again, fast, hammer's cocked, he cocks the hammer, points it straight at Ms. Hutchins, and fires that gun sending that live bullet right into Ms. Hutchins' body. You will learn that this bullet was a 45 caliber round that entered Ms. Hutchins' body right underneath her right underarm. It perforated her right lung. It traveled through her spine, lacerating her spinal cord, and then it exited on the left side of her back. That bullet then went into Joel Souza's right shoulder and it came to rest in his back from where doctors removed it once he was transported to St. Vincent's Hospital here in Santa Fe. You will learn, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Hutchins did not have the same fate. You will see the aftermath of the shooting and you will see medics frantically working to save Ms. Hutchins, to stabilize her, to transport her, to airlift her to UNM Hospital. But the damage from that bullet was too much. Ms. Hutchins succumbed to her injuries and bled to death. The evidence will show that meanwhile, after the shooting, the defendant began to claim he didn't pull the trigger. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that's not possible. You will hear from Mr. Pieta himself who will tell you that gun will not discharge without a pull of the trigger. You will hear from firearms experts who will tell you that gun will not discharge without a pull of that trigger. The evidence will show that law enforcement officials arrived at the scene on October 21st after the shooting 
and immediately took this gun into their custody. Then later, they asked the FBI for assistance in processing this gun for forensics and examination. You will learn that the gun and some ammunition that was taken from the set and from PDQ arms were sent to the FBI for analysis. You will learn that the gun first went to the DNA section of the lab where a DNA analyst found the defendant's DNA on this gun and then the gun was transferred to the firearms and tool mark section of the lab where a firearms examiner examined this gun very carefully and closely. Bryce Ziegler, who is the firearms examiner for the FBI, will tell you that when he received this firearm, he first examined it, he didn't see any defects, didn't see any modifications. He tried and he checked the hammer in the three different positions, cocking positions. He checked the quarter cock position, fine. Checked the half cock position, fine. Checked the full cock position, fine. And when he held it in the full cock position, you will hear that hammer held until he pulled the trigger. You will also hear that Mr. Ziegler test fired this gun 12 different times. And each time that gun fired as it was designed. Each time when he pulled that trigger, it fired. And he will tell you that not once did this gun malfunction or discharge on its own. Now the evidence will show that because the defendant had been claiming that he didn't pull the trigger, Mr. Ziegler suggested one last test to the Sheriff's Department. Mr. Ziegler told the Sheriff's Department that he could do what's called an accidental discharge test. He obtained authorization to do this test and you will hear that he left that test for last because that test <coughs> could potentially damage the gun. Mr. Ziegler went forward after he received this authorization and conducted the accidental discharge test. And you will hear, ladies and gentlemen, that during that test, a couple of the internal components of this firearm damaged. You will hear that the trigger sear and the full cock hammer notch were damaged during the accidental discharge testing. <coughs> The evidence will show, however, that before this accidental discharge testing by the FBI, this gun functioned and worked perfectly fine. You'll see the video footage of the multiple occasions during which the defendant used this firearm on the set, and each time he fired it, it was working just fine. And in fact, you'll hear evidence that the defendant himself admitted in December of 2021 that this gun didn't have any mechanical problems. You will hear from the two of the country's leading experts on firearms forensics, Michael Haig and Lucian Haig. And they will tell you that they examined the revolver and the damaged pieces extensively. They will tell you that the damage to the full cock trigger notch is consistent with the accidental discharge testing that was conducted by the FBI. Lucian Haig will tell you that in August of 2023, he examined the trigger sear, the other piece, and that when he looked at it initially with the naked eye, there was nothing wrong with it. He couldn't see anything. But then he put it under the microscope, and he noticed some kind of rough microscopic diagonal lines on the surface of the trigger sear. And since at the time he did not know how Mr. Ziegler had conducted the accidental discharge test, he opined that these very small microscopic lines were likely not caused by the FBI accidental discharge testing, but he could not exclude that as the source of those lines. Then a few weeks ago, Mr. Haig will tell you that he spoke with Mr. Ziegler and he learned how Mr. Ziegler had conducted the accidental discharge test. Mr. Ziegler 
explained that he affixed that firearm onto a fixed platform and then struck the firearm on six different planes with a rubber mallet. And Mr. Ziegler explained to Mr. Haig that he had not affixed the mallet to another fixed device. Instead, he did it freehand. Mr. Haig will tell you with his 50 plus years of experience as a forensic, firearms forensics expert, he opined or concluded that those very tiny microscopic diagonal lines on the surface of the trigger sear were likely caused by the FBI's accidental discharge test. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that regardless of how those tiny microscopic lines got on that trigger sear, these firearms experts will tell you that those would not affect the functionality of this firearm. At the end of this case, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to conclude and be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that on October 21st, 2021, that gun the defendant had asked to be assigned worked perfectly fine as it was designed and that the fatal and one of the main problems that afternoon of October 21st was that the defendant didn't do a gun safety check with that inexperienced armorer. He pointed the gun at another human being, cocked the hammer, and pulled that trigger in reckless disregard for Ms. Hutchins' safety. And you will be convinced that the only true and just verdict in this case, so that true justice can be served, is a verdict of guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Spiro. Good morning. This was an unspeakable tragedy, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. He was an actor acting, playing the role of Harlan Rust. An actor playing a character can act in ways that are lethal, that just aren't lethal on a movie set. These cardinal rules, they're not cardinal rules on a movie set. And I don't have to tell you much more about this because you've all seen gunfights in movies. And the reason that can happen is because safety is ensured before the actor. On this movie set, there were people responsible for ensuring the safety of the set and the firearm. Those people failed in their duties, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. The most critical issue in this case is how a real bullet got on a movie set. The evidence will show that real bullets are never supposed to be on movie sets. Movie sets use dummies and blanks. Movie sets use dummies, fake inert bullets that look like real bullets, they don't go bang, for when you want a close-up of the gun. You can't tell them apart from live bullets by looking at them, which is why live bullets can be nowhere near a movie set. And if the director wants a shot of the gun going, you know, bang poof, there's blanks that they can use, and those blanks look nothing like real bullets, and they um, are used for those shooting scenes. And, you know, they'll play these videos that they described of Alex, you know, front firearm in the movie going bang poof, you know, and people are conditioned to seeing people firing weapons and thinking that's a dangerous act, that's a dangerous act. And they will play those videos and give you that image to try to tarnish him in your eyes. But that's not what happened here. On this set, there was a real bullet 
something that should never be on a movie set, something which has nothing to do with making a movie. And you will hear no evidence, not one word, that Alec Baldwin had anything to do with that real bullet being brought onto that set. The second critical issue in this case is why did a real bullet get loaded into a prop movie gun? It is undisputed that the bullet was loaded into the gun by the armorer, the person on set whose responsibility it was to ensure the gun was safe. And so picture that moment of the armorer placing a live bullet into that firearm. You know, you hear the prosecutor say, you know, he did this or he performed in a certain way. He picked out the biggest gun as his prop. It's to tarnish him in your eyes. You will hear no evidence whatsoever, no evidence that anything Mr. Baldwin did, that something he did in that moment, that horrible moment when she put that bullet in that gun, none of it had anything to do with Alec Baldwin. And finally, the first assistant director's job, the head of safety, Dave Halls, checks it before it goes to the actor. And he will tell you he made a tragic mistake. He failed to detect a live bullet. And Alec Baldwin had nothing to do with that either. So all this evidence that the prosecutor just outlined, all of it, has nothing to do with these critical issues. Nothing. Which leads us to this. The evidence will show that on a movie set, safety has to occur before the gun is placed in the actor's hands. In this case, this unique case on a movie set, the prop gun was placed in Mr. Baldwin's hands and cold gun was announced, meaning it had been checked and double-checked by those responsible to ensure the gun was safe. It was just a prop. They all thought it was just a prop and could do no harm. The actor's job is to act, to rehearse, to choreograph his moves, to memorize his lines. He's Harlan Rust. He's an outlaw running for his life, who in the incident in question, he's pulling a six-shooter to try to defend himself. That's why the gun has to be safe before it gets into the actor's hands. His mind is somewhere else, in the being of another, a century away, an outlaw. He must be able to take that weapon and use it as the person he's acting would. To wave it, to point it, to pull the trigger like actors do, in ways that would be lethal in the real world, but are not lethal on a movie set. And I'm going to show you that scene now before lunch. And if we could just play action. I don't need no damn help. You're gonna die if I don't. He's wounded on the run. Can play again? Continue. All the rust. You just stand up nice and slow. Toss any weapons you have. He's on the church pew, bleeding, his hand gripping the revolver. He would defend himself against the men in the movie. Play. One more. You good? Ready? Set. Ready? Yeah. Arlen Rust. Did you get up nice and slow, tossing the weapons you have? <clears throat>
Ireland rest. It's a scene similar to scenes we've all seen in movies and television, performed by thousands of actors. And the scene that continues after lunch is the same scene, it's just not unfortunately captured on videotape. And the scene they envisioned and acted out, that prop gun was positioned in the afternoon so close to the camera that you could see inside, that you could feel it. You could feel that it was loaded, and it was loaded, of course, with dummies. Dummies to make it look like a real gun. But this one time, one of those dummies was a real bullet. The real bullet was not known to anyone in that church. Amongst the actors, directors, and crew in the scene, everyone was doing exactly how they go about their business every day on a movie, not as if some lethal element had been included in the environment. You will see creativity and movement and everyone talking and vibrant. No one had any idea that this venomous, toxic element had been inserted into this magic they were creating. But it did. It entered that place. It killed an amazing person. It wounded another. And it changed lives forever. And so to find out what happened on that movie set, you, knew, you need to do something that the prosecutors could never do. You have to step back and remember what they were doing on a movie set. What were Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer, Joel Souza, the director, and Alec Baldwin, the actor, doing on Bonanza Creek Ranch? You know, movies and magic have always been closely associated. The first people that made movies were magicians. And this imagination that happens in movies, you know, King Kong, he can stand above a city, and Superman can fly, horses and snakes, and gun battles. For this to all work, for cinematography, what Helena did to work, for acting to work. You have to be so close to the barrier of real and imagined that the viewer feels that they're there, that it's real. The viewer can't see strings from the stuntman. The stuntman must leap. The snake must hiss. And guns happen in movies all over this country for many decades. Bang, bang. You've all seen it. Guns have been an element of theater and film and television since the earliest of times. Depictions of war and combat Spartacus, it stirs audiences because it feels real. Later films, Platoon, Apocalypse Now, they showed the unvarnished realities of war. This ranch, Santa Fe, it had been the scene to many gunfights and movie scenes, well before Alec was even born. Laramie, Butch and the Sundance Kid, and these westerns... The evidence will show that guns are in movies because movies are about people's lives and guns are in people's lives. So let's talk about the evidence and how the lethal bullet got there. How did this happen and how did it unfold? The evidence will be the following. Everybody on a movie set has a role. The armor or armors, the director directs, the actor acts. They work in harmony, but they have a division of responsibility. Safety being important has the first assistant director, whose name is Dave Halls, above the, the, the armor and the sort of the safety of the set. And on that day in question, the cast and the creative directors and crew in the church, it's a, it's a fake church, their actors are not in their normal clothes, it's costumes, there's debris falling from the ceiling, it's fake debris, and they yell out cold gun. And that is an important term you're gonna learn in this case. It means that the gun is cold. No one need worry. But even that requires a little bit more explanation. Cold gun doesn't mean no live bullets. There are for sure 100% no live bullets on movie sets. That's unimaginable. Cold means you don't even have the fake, fake blank poof um, dump, uh, uh, in it. You don't need to worry even about you know, eye gear or, or, or um, 
earplugs for, for that fake bang. It means it's empty, inert, cosmetic, can do no harm. Cold guns can't hurt people. It's impossible, literally impossible for a cold gun to hurt somebody. You, you, you could hurt you more by dropping it on your foot. And that's why these artists are carrying on in their art. Cold gun, gun, all clear to go. And the armorer on this set hands a prop gun to Alec, like she had done times before, like people have done with him in movies for a generation. And he's there. He's in the movie set church with his movie set gear and his holster, and he takes his movie set gun. And he's deeply focused in that moment on his character. The artists, the crew members, they're, they're moving around him. Again, no, no eye, eye gear or earplugs, nothing to protect against. They carry on. They practice. They rehearse. They take a lunch break. Some folks leave. Some don't. They continue the scene. Dave Halls, the head of safety, is actually practicing the movement so they can frame. They can frame the, the footage that will happen after lunch. And the prop cold gun comes back. The prop cold gun comes back. Cold gun. They call it again. Same gun, again, safe. The first assistant director, Dave Halls, head of safety for the entire film, a man with decades of experience, comes and takes the additional step and inspects the gun, verifies again, cold gun. Everyone relax. Go back to focus on the making of a movie. There's nothing in the gun that can hurt anybody. And Alex sits on that pew. And they, the creative directors, the crew, they're moving around him, in front of him. And Harlan Rust, he begins, like the prosecutor told you, rehearsing, acting. This is a completely mundane, uneventful, routine act on a movie set. On a movie set. And so everybody carries on. Nobody fathomed, imagined, foresaw any possible danger. They moved around Alec as he practiced his draw. As the prosecutor put it, working out the details of the move in the actor. He does it does it again, does it in a different way. Nobody bats an eye. And they will tell you that the investigation revealed that Baldwin was practicing drawing and pointing the weapon of the scene with guidance and instruction from Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza. The gun goes off. Everybody's shocked. Alec is startled. He, 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 oh, he immediately says, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I didn't mean to shoot the gun, I, I didn't pull the trigger, immediately. What the hell just happened? They collectively explain. Shock turns to panic. 911 is called. Ambulance at Alex Bonanza Creek Ranch right now. We've had two people shot on a movie set accidentally. He said someone was shot. Two people accidentally. Gunshots at on movie set Bonanza Creek Ranch. I'll connect you with medical dispatch. Don't need that. Santa Fe Fire and EMS wants the location of emergency. No, uh, Bonanza Creek Ranch has had two people accidentally shot on a movie set by a prop gun. We need help immediately. Okay. And this fucking AD that yelled at me at lunch because I was coming about revision. This motherfucker. Did you see him yell at my table and yell at me? He's a disgusted gun. He's responsible for what happened to him. Now, Mimi? No, no, no. I'm a script supervisor. How, I ran how many sitting, people were injured? Two I was, that I know of. I was sitting, we were rehearsing, and it went off, and I ran out. Accidentally shot on a movie set with a prop gun. The fucking AD, it was his responsibility. Not a word about Alec Baldwin. While they're en route, police, EMS, the cast and crew are outside trying to figure out what happened, frantic, talking to those responsible for the prop and its safety. The armorer is yelling, sorry. Halls, the first assistant director, is panicked. The prop master, Sarah Zachary, I, I don't know exactly where she is at, at, at that point, but they check the gun fervishly. They take the ammo out of the gun they look at it, what the heck happened. They go back to the prop cart that houses the ammo. They're touching the gun and manipulating the gun, emptying it. They go and move some stuff off the prop cart, trying to figure it out. Sarah Zachary, the head of props, will tell you she threw some stuff out. And, and eventually, of course, EMS and police arrive pretty soon thereafter. 
and Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza, the director, are transported to the hospital where Helena tragically passes away. And, and I'm not going to be asking questions about her condition after she was wounded or the medical interventions that followed. Her injuries, the efforts to revive her are not in dispute in this case. Um, the evidence will, will be there. The prosecutor may present some of these emotionally charged images, um, but we're not going to be asking questions about that, and it's not an issue in dispute in this case. Um, and and uh, you jurors are allowed to ask yourselves whether or not that should be the focus or the focus should be the evidence. So police enter the scene. They have lapel cameras. Thank God they have lapel cameras. You want to see what happens? The evidence will show you can play the videotape. Want to see if they take the right gun? Play the videotape. Want to make sure what the people said or did they're remembering correctly? Play the videotape. And so they immediately recover the prop gun and they secure it. That's off to the side. And, and the reason that you preserve things in the moment is so that you know what existed in the moment, the evidence in the moment, the people and the witnesses and what they said in the moment. These folks, the members of Rust, they'd never been through anything like this before. That is why what they originally said matters so much in this case. If you remember anything I say today as the evidence proceeds, remember that. Look at the evidence of what the people of Rust said and did that day. Life changes, memories change, there are human motivations, internal pressure, external pressure. That's why preservation is so important. So the police continue. In terms of the prop cart and the prop ammo that's on the cart, it's manipulated, altered, kind of messy. Um, and you know, at this accidental shooting on a movie set, the police begin to make some mistakes. No one had ever investigated a prop gun on a movie set before. They recover the prop gun, but they don't wear gloves. They don't have the prop car inside the crime scene. Someone moves it onto the crime scene. People start touching it and showing, okay, this is a dummy, this is a blank. And then they make another mistake that, that matters in this case um, um, with some more significance, which is that they don't secure the prop truck that houses the cart. See, that cart that they roll off comes from a truck where all of the ammunition, all of the firearms are, and that's where they're stored. They don't secure the prop truck for several days. Um, and then the prop house that supplies the truck, that supplies the car, they don't secure for over a month. A lot of mistakes. They had never investigated a case in a movie set. But they had the prop gun. That was key. Um, and so they needed to figure out where the live bullet came from. They had the shell casing, Starline Brass. That's the, that's the sort of make. You'll hear that phrase, Starline Brass. And the police were right to focus on that. That was the lethal element. And so they work outward. Makes good enough sense. Folks around the ammo and the gun to be interviewed at the precinct. The armorer at the precinct. She loaded the live bullet. Hall's head of safety. He double checked. And Alec walks up to the police. You'll see this early today. And he says, I'm here. Whatever you want to do. Whatever you need me to do. Just tell me where to go. And uh, Sarah Zachary, the prop master who threw out the stuff at the cart, they, they missed her that night. Um, to bring to the precinct, but the rest of them at the precinct. And thankfully, we have the lapel cameras. And then we cleared, they cleared the gun outside after uh, his request, and I witnessed them clear it and saw the bullets. Okay. So, so the one was, yes. the one that was missing, the one that, the one that, that fired, we don't know, but all the other ones were proper. I can turn, I can pause this. I can turn this off. Move on. That was just a, a quick snapshot of the scene. Let, let, let's approach, Robert. Uh, this is Ms. Johnson. They consented to the exhibit.
the remaining witnesses from inside the church are interviewed on the scene. They're interviewed with lapel cameras. They're interviewed by the lead detective, Detective Cano. And those witnesses, some of them will come in here and testify. And not a single one of them will tell you anything different than what I'm about to tell you about the evidence. The gun was double checked, verified it was a cold gun, not an actor's responsibility to check. Safety was ensured before. Alec was doing his practicing, his rehearsing, his movements. People manipulate and point guns on movie sets. The gun went off during the rehearsal. No one saw him intentionally pull the trigger. It was obviously a tragic accident, but Alec committed no homicide. Alec took the gun from those charged with its safety. He did not tamper with it. He did not load it himself. He did not leave it unattended. It completed his costume and his character. It was an actor handling a prop and integrating it into the character of Harlan Rust. There was a dedicated professional there, off camera, whose sole sacred responsibility was that prop safety. And Dave Halls, the head of safety, was there by her side. Everyone relied on that. And it was tragic that they let them down. He was just acting as he has done for generations, and it was the safety apparatus that failed them all. So law enforcement continues. They need to find the live bullet. That was the lethal element. So they, led by Detective Cano, execute a search warrant on the church, and that's what law enforcement does. They immediately go to a judge. They say, this is what we need to do. They go into the church urgently before anything can be altered. They're confirming it was an accident, not a crime in the church. They search for guns and ammunition, videos and photos. There was no further answer in the church. They had the prop gun. They had all those witnesses secured. Their statements are clear. Alec had committed no crime, but the bullet was a mystery. And so they focus on the bullet, the critical lethal bullet, and how did it enter the movie set. So they had the prop cart, and then they go do the warrant on the prop truck. And so at that point, and I'm going to put up a photo so that you can see who some of these individuals are. Um, they're trying to figure out when they go to the truck, where is, what is the source of the lethal, lethal bullet? And so they execute a warrant on the truck approximately a week later. The Seth Kenny that you heard about in the prosecutor's opening, the supplier for the set, he's there. Sarah Zachary, the prop master, she's there. And they walk through what's inside of the prop truck with law enforcement but there's no answer to the lethal bullet. And you know, the, 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 this case then takes on, you know, uh, uh, all this pressure, you know, the media begins swirling. Where is the lethal bullet? How did it got, get on that movie set? And what about that actor, Alec Baldwin, who had nothing to do with why the bullet got on the movie set? And so police and prosecutors, they work hand in hand, meeting after meeting, trying to find the lethal bullet, meeting with Seth Kenny meeting with Sarah Zachary, the prop master, the supplier. Where is it? And about a month after the incident, Sarah Zachary finally sits down with law enforcement to answer some questions. And um, she explains to them that she, she threw away some stuff. She, she disposed of some stuff. Um, and they, the prosecutors and police keep meeting, swirling media, and then at that point, they go to the last step, right? We've done the cart, we've gone to the truck, we met with Sarah Zachary, and they go execute a search warrant on, as the prosecutor told you, PDQ, the prop house. And again, Seth Kenny's there to greet them, let them in, and they don't find the lethal bullet. They never did. They never did. And as things roll in to police and prosecutors, cell phones and photos and forensics, looking for this shiny object, they found another shiny object. Instead of trying to find the source of the lethal bullet, they focused on Mr. Baldwin. But Mr. Baldwin was like every other actor. He goes bang bang in movies. He's told when guns are cold or not. He rehearses and acts as his character. Safety proceeds before the actor. Once the actor has the prop gun, he can handle it however a person he's acting as would. A properly cleared gun can't hurt anybody. And so they told you about some of the things that Alex said in the statements that they will, they will take or, or pick out a few lines from. 
But he won't tell you anything different, that he, that he took a gun loaded and cleared by the armor and the A day. He made motions with the gun as he was rehearsing. He didn't intentionally pull the trigger. The gun just went off. And he does say, I didn't have a problem with the gun before. And this idea, you know, that they said that he, that he, would have, he didn't want to check because he would offend them, you know, in this moment, he, he's been doing this for 40 years, the evidence will show. And he has habits, and there are also SAG guidelines that tell actors what to do and what not to do. And the SAG guidelines don't tell actors to check the gun. You will see them. That's not the actor's role. And so I guess the point that they're trying to make is that why in this specific moment he doesn't break his habit of 40 years and, and check it differently and sort of insult them this one time. You know, if he had done that and started playing with the gun in that way, they'd be saying, arrogant actor, why is he doing that? So they will play these statements, Alex's statements. You're going to hear a man in shock and grief, a father, a, an artist, worried about his family. You hear he's... You know, uh, uh, on one of the calls, he's, he's going to meet with the decedent's family, the Hutchins family, and he's upset about that. He will talk to law enforcement. He will call them. He doesn't need a lawyer. He didn't commit a crime. He will call them and offer to meet and speak over and over again. And ask anyone in the acting world. Actors know. Actors rely on armors and point guns and shoot guns. The armorers act. What they did is clear and proven. The head of safety, you will learn, took responsibility for his verification failure. But Alec committed no homicide. So law enforcement didn't have a homicide case against Alec Baldwin. But they changed the question. You heard the prosecutor tell you about this, did he pull the trigger? Did he pull the trigger? Did he intentionally pull the trigger? And if, if he did, of course, that would only make his statement incorrect. Right? That would mean he would have misspoke, been incorrect. You know, and I want to stop for a moment and just tell you, because you're going to hear a lot of testimony, expert testimony that the prosecutor told you, about the gun functioning imperfectly. Did he let the hammer down when he cocked it? Did he hit the trigger? Did he, in a calculated manner, as the prosecutor met, um, made a motion, you know, fire the gun like that? And when this issue is discussed, it's easy to sort of pull yourself into courtroom land and away from a movie set. On a movie set, you're allowed to pull the trigger. So even if, even if he intentionally pulled the trigger like the prosecutor just demonstrated, that doesn't make him guilty of homicide. He did not know or have any reason to know that gun was loaded with a live bullet. That's the key. That live bullet is the key. That is the lethal element. But again, as the prosecutor told you, they, if they could prove that he intentionally pulled the trigger and he was imperfect, imprecise, wrong with what he said, then maybe you take that and you say he's lying. And if he's a liar, he committed homicide. And so what they do is they take the prop gun. They're blinded by the shine. They're blinded by trying to disprove Alec. They take it and they order a destructive test on the firearm. They order the FBI to take a test that they know will destroy the firearm. It's a pointless, unnecessary test where they blindly try to make this big case by taking a mallet and smashing the firearm. At the time that they did that, they knew that Alec had, had maintained, adamantly maintained, that he was manipulating the hammer and the gun just went off. That the witnesses said it went off out of nowhere. That there are these accidental discharges that happen on the set. That guns have issues in the real world. That this gun had a hair trigger. And the owner's manual of this specific gun actually says that if you load it with a live round or any round in the chamber, in, in that last position, and you drop it like you see a cowboy in a movie, this type of old cowboy gun can accidentally go off. I don't remember hearing anything about that. The evidence will show that. So rather than trying to answer the question of what happened, they proceed with the destructive test. They eliminate the one item, <clears throat> the one item that could prove what Alex said and believed. They didn't offer him a chance to test the gun. They didn't take the gun apart before they broke it and destroyed it and look at its inner workings. They didn't turn on their videotape. They just destroyed it. Can't ever be tested in the same condition it was in that day. Won't ever allow Alex to show his truth. And the destruction of this gun that you will hear in this evidence is symbolic of this entire case. Because the officers will tell you at that point, 
they weren't really investigating anymore. They were trying to disprove Alec, to get Alec, to have this day. And so after the destruction of the firearm, they hired some expert witnesses you heard about to, to pick up the pieces, so to speak. And the state retained Lucian Haig, an expert with over half a century of experience. And he will come into court and he will tell you he's never seen anything like this in his entire career. They conducted a pointless test, a test that would lead to inevitable destruction of the firearm. There were other correct tests that they could have done to prove whether or not it could have accidentally discharged. None of the experts can test the gun in the condition it was in on the day in question. Why? Not because of something that Alec Baldwin or the crew members of Russ did. They were all clear. The gun just went off. But because of something that law enforcement did. And they deprived him of that opportunity. However, Lucian Haig will tell you that in his analysis, he did find modification that he thought likely pre-existed the FBI testing. And what that modification means and, and how it impacted the gun is hard to perfectly know, of course. But it, it was a modification on an important part, the critical part of the firearm. And it was important enough for them to put into a report and to write a new opinion about they felt this revelation had to be sent to prosecutors, and they maintained that position that this modification was a matter of import for almost a year. And then a few weeks ago, before trial, they just took it back. They just took it back. You will get to see the circumstances of that take back. How far they would go for the shiny object. They never solved the question of the lethal bullet. They destroyed the gun, and all they were left with is Alec Baldwin and the movie they intend to put on. But because they never solved the lethal bullet, they eliminated the prop gun, there will not be one witness, not one shred of evidence in this trial, that Alec knew or should have known the gun was loaded with a live round. So they can't prove. They can't prove their high-profile homicide kid. So they, they will proceed to then, here and now, tell you about other things, other evidence that you will hear that has nothing to do with what happened in the church on October 21st. That the movie said as, as a whole was improper, or anything, that, he, that they hired the wrong armorer, I think I heard in, in opening. The, the, the evidence will show that the armorer was hired by somebody else, trained by somebody else, had done gun scenes on rust with somebody else before Alec even got there. She was the daughter and the apprentice of the most famous and well-respected armorer in Hollywood. And she had just loved, left serving being an armorer for Nicolas Cage on another Western. Then they'll come in and they'll say, but what about the movie guidelines? You heard about Mr. Jorgensen and the movie guidelines. That, that one of the protocols wasn't followed. Or there was a set safety issue about, about something unrelated to this. Like these movie guidelines on, on, on a set or the things of Navy SEALs and NASA. The guidelines were followed. They followed the safety guidelines. Actors don't check the weapons. Safety is ensured by dedicated personnel. So they will say, you know, but there had been accidental discharges on the set that guns had fired accidentally prior. Not related to Alec, by the way. You know, but again, that's the people we looked at. Hannah Gutierrez Reed's fault, Sarah Zachary's fault, perhaps, Dave Hall's fault, faults, workplace issues. Some of them will end up, and you will hear the witnesses in this case, many of them have brought civil lawsuits. You know, and you'll hear that you know, in those civil lawsuits, they're presenting evidence to try to meet a burden, not a, not a criminal, beyond a reasonable doubt, homicide trial burden, but they're going to try to prove their cases in civil courts. And that's where faults and accidents are, at worst, 99% worked out. Not here. But you'll hear these members of the Russ crew come in here. They'll try to make sense of this for you. Some of them have sued. Some of them are in grief. Some of them are in grief and have sued. And part of this grief they feel that everybody feels is understandable. And what they will do is they will tell you, you know, if, if only we had had a second armorer. One of them will say, if only Dave Halls had checked better. If only the camera hadn't been right there and Ms. Hutchins wasn't leaning over the camera. 
If only I myself did this. If only Alec did that. This is natural, their testimony. It's part of the human condition. It's part of grief. Objection, Your Honor. None of them knew. Yes. As I was saying, the witnesses in their grief will look for reasons to try to make sense of this tragedy. But again, none of them knew or should have known about the lethal bullet either. No one had any idea that it was on that set or in that gun. In that world, they were all in it together. And you will hear that none of this other stuff has anything to do with those two critical questions we started with. Why there was a live bullet on set? why the armor replaced it in the gun, and of course, why the head of safety failed to detect it. None of it speaks to whether Alec knew or should have known those things. He didn't, no one on that set did. It was not foreseeable. You will hear that word from the witnesses and from, the, and from eventually the instructions, foreseeable. This was anything other than foreseeable. And they must prove beyond any and all reasonable doubt that this was foreseeable total indifference to human life that death might occur. He's an actor. He's an actor. But here we are at a homicide trial. And so they will pull and they will pull witnesses and, and witnesses will be cross-examined. They will push themselves to the edge of truth and beyond. You know, these things about you know, Alec didn't notice this or Alec didn't notice that, I want to make sure that you're clear on something that the evidence will show. He had been filming on that set for a handful of days. The evidence will show he had just gotten there. It's not as if he had been there for months and months and noticed things and failed things. And he had just gotten there. You don't notice every little thing when you start at a new place and when you're in the character of Harlan Rust. But they will push forward and they will have gaps in the evidence as well. Don't expect you to be hearing and for them to call the first AD head of safety. I don't know if you'll be hearing from the lead detective, Canal, who investigated this case, the lead detective, or the sergeant that supervised him, Sergeant Zook. I don't think you'll hear from Mr. Schilling, who was the lead investigator for the prosecutors. And so as you hear this, the jur you jurors can, can assess about that gap of evidence. And there's one thing that I can tell you you will not hear also. You will not hear from an actor or an expert in acting. And so they will play the videotapes of Alec Baldwin, the actor, acting. They will show you perhaps over and over again him in shooting scenes. Bad Alec. Bad Alec shooting a gun the wrong way in a movie scene. They will try to get you to picture that and forget that this was a movie set in the first place. And you will see actors in a Western acting. And your mind might go to your favorite gun scene in your favorite movie. You may picture actors and actresses doing exactly what you see here. The other actors in Rust are doing the same thing that Mr. Baldwin was doing. But when you come back from that moment, remember, this is a homicide trial. And you will, see, you will see soon that the reason they play those videos of him over and over is because they don't have any ev evidence of actual homicide. And you will learn the truth. Not a day goes by when we don't wish Alec had saved her life. But never the witnesses will tell you in the history is something that an actor has done, intercepted a live bullet from a prop gun. No actor in, in history. No one could have imagined or expected an actor to do that. So just remember that truth. So when they cry out justice, justice is truth. This was an unspeakable tragedy. Alec Baldwin committed no crime. Thank you. All right, thank you. What we're going to do now is we're going to take our... Um morning um, bathroom break. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, and um, follow what Mr. Bing tells you to do. And um, what we'll see you back here about 20 of. All right. Thank you.
Call your first witness. <laughs> uh, state calls Nicholas Lafleur. Sir, please uh, raise your right hand. Do you swear firm under penalty of law that? Do. Yes. All right. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Sure. Rules and votes. I'm sorry. Uh, with regard to the uh, invocation of the rule, um, our case agent is in, the, is in the room. We just wanted to put that on the record. The, the, the prosecutor indicated that they'd be calling the case agent early in the case. So given that, I, I did, did not continue my objection that I had earlier to her being present. Thank you. Case agents allowed in. State, state your name and spell your last name for the court record, please. My name is Nicholas LaFleur. My last name is spelled L-E-F-L-E-U-R. And how are you currently employed? The City of Santa Fe Police Department. And what do you do there? Uh, police officer. How long have you been employed at the City of Santa Fe? Two years. Can everyone hear Officer LaFleur? Okay. Um, and prior to working for the Santa Fe Police Department, uh, did you work anywhere else? Yes, ma'am. Where did you work? The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. And how long did you work at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? About two years. And were you on duty on October 21st of 2021? Yes. Did you receive a dispatch call? Yes. Can you tell us what, what you received and what you did? Um, a call came in that there was someone shot at a movie set. Um, unclear who shot, how many were shot. I happened to be the closest person to the call and arrived on scene first. So when you arrived on scene, when you say first, were there other law enforcement officers there? No. Not at the time when I got there. Uh, were there any other um, first responders present? There were some fire rail, fire personnel and what they called the scene medic for the uh, movie, movie set, I guess. You said a scene medic? Yeah. Okay. So when you, let, let me ask you, when you receive a call uh, for a shooting, What's your primary concern? Priority life. And what do you and mean make when you say priority life? Uh, make sure um, per whoever needs help gets help and that the, the threat is stopped. And when you arrived on the, the scene, and where was it? Um, uh, Bonanza Creek. Um, movie set, I guess. It's, it's quite a ways off the interstate. Okay. Um, and what uh, county and state is that in? Santa Fe County, um, state of New Mexico. Okay. Uh, so when, w when you arrived there, g give us an idea of what you saw. What was going on? Um, it was a big, old, um, like cowboy western theme like city or a town. There's a bunch of people running everywhere. Um, bunch of cars, a um, bunch of people pointing. Um, when I got there, uh, people were pointing towards a, a church. Um, and I got out, and I attempted to grab my medical bag and went in and saw. Hey, hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you there. Uh, approximately how many people were there on scene? I don't have the direct number, but there was more than 100 people. Um, have you ever been called uh, to a shooting where there were a hundred people already on scene? No. Um, did that present any specific challenges for you? Yes. Ex explain to us what those challenges were. Um, just there's a lot of moving parts. Um, just got to take it one one piece at a time. See who's hurt. Um, 
make sure that one that nobody's continually getting hurt and then two the person who's hurt um, medical attention is being given to them and then go from there okay um, and when you arrived on scene that day uh, were you running your body worn camera yes uh, the state moves for the admission of state's exhibit four no further objections run Am I are you, are you, uh, I want to just make sure I'm connected. I'm ready to play it. All right. Make sure permission to publish? Well, is you going to recognize it first? Or have, are, you, are you satisfied with the foundation? Yes, Your Honor. We've consented to both la la lapel videos right. today. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So you may publish. If this is uh, States 1? Four. 4. 4. States 4. Okay. How do I get the monitors to come on? Well, I just wanted to do it. Okay. You know how to do it? Go ahead, do it. This one's not. We'll turn it it's on, but it's green light. Green light's on. Let me go get the factory. Well, can he redo it from here while he's looking? Or do you want? Sure, if the monitor won't just come on. Won't just come on. He's got to get the adapter. Go get the adapter. Right. Okay. Uh, Officer LaFleur, do you want to turn around and, and just look at the monitor on the wall behind you? It doesn't matter, man. Okay, let's do that. You got your, you got your tonic kit? Yeah, I'm trying to get it out. Stupid new truck. I'll be inside with the PBMs. Officer LaFleur, tell us, t tell us what's going on in the video right now. Um, I'm looking for my other medic bag. I handed the individual a, a trauma pack um, for shooting, and I'm attempting to open a, um, one of the storage boxes and, in the back of the truck. Who, who was the individual that you handed something to? Um, the, I believe it was a fire per fire personnel that I followed in, a volunteer firefighter maybe. And I, I thought I heard uh, the word, is it BVM? Um, it's it's for CPR. It's a bag valve mask. Bag so, valve yeah, mask. BVM. Okay, thank you. Talking about there when you say air flight. Um, uh, 
helicopter that's designed to transport people that need advanced treatment faster than the ambulance? It's a helicopter that air paramedics basically. Uh, did you call for the helicopter or, or did someone else do that? Do you know? Um, that individual said that they had already called one, but I, I called one for his one as well. You called radio. also? Yes, ma'am. And, and why did you feel that it was necessary to have a helicopter arrive? Someone who was shot across the chest. Um, we're quite a ways out for an ambulance to, in reference to where the hospital is. So. And when you say you were quite a ways out, how, how far away is Bonanza Creek? From a hospital? Sure. Um, running lights and sirens, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or more. Okay. Santa Fe, one female shot in the chest, male shot in the stomach, request an air flight. I heard you there say male shot in the stomach. Is that what you said? Um, I'm not sure. I didn't really hear it. Um. Well, as you sit here today, do you recall uh, where the other person was shot? Somewhere in the chest. Okay. Or shoulder area. Thank you. I got uh, just sent by medics. In your video, sir, can you identify who the set medic is? Uh, it's a little blurry, but I believe it's this lady, right? Um. The one that's bent over with their blondish brown hair. Is the monitor working now? Yeah. Yes. This monitor is working now. Oh, it is? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do, do, you, do you know how to touch it to, to put it? There you go. Thank no. you. I appreciate you. You can go ahead and remove that. Oh, I don't know how to remove it. How to, can you show them how to remove it? Oh, uh, push on the menu button. Okay. Then if it's in the way, just push the menu. Do you know who these other people are that are in the room? No, I know that uh, that person, that person, and somebody over here, um, the battalion chief. They were were in Santa Fe medic. Uh, county fire medic shirts so and they came in in the, the vehicle in front of me you don't know who the other people are that are in the room um, I know the other person shot and then um, Elena Hutchins or I don't know, misspelled her name or pronounced it and then the uh, other assistant director and that's about it okay um, and you mentioned that, that there was a, a, a truck pulling in ahead of you. It was a volunteer firefighter truck. So did the first responders that we see here in this scene, did they arrive about the same time you did? Yes. Santa Fe both approximately 140 pounds elderly male and young female would he need me no <laughs> Do you want a BBM? Uh, yeah, she said, Hell yeah, please. Yeah. He's good. He's got a shoulder. He's got a broken shoulder. Uh, this is obviously a repeat your information. Did you find her out? Yeah, she'll be there. All right. Okay. 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 Okay.
Officer LaFleur, tell us what you're doing now and why. Um, I looked over and I seen that they were getting the oxygen tank out. Um, noticed that they were using on a bag valve mask, which I was more appropriate for that situation than the one that goes around their face. Um, I'm just helping them, doing as much as I can to help. So g give us a little bit more information. Uh, what causes you to believe that the bag valve mask is... Use manual um, breaths. They could use the bag. The other one is just something that's over their face. Okay. And what made you think that the bag valve mask was more appropriate? Um, nothing really. I just believe it's, it's, that's more, I don't know. Officer LaFleur, are you trained in life-saving measures? To an extent, yes. Okay. Was it anything about your training that caused you to think that that would be more appropriate? Uh, it's just what we've tra been trained with versus the one that uh, was already on her. Okay. Stay busy, help clear the way for the stretcher. The ambulance is here. So it looks like more paramedics have arrived and Lieutenant Benavides is right there. Okay, the, uh, and, and uh, do you mean this gentleman here? Yes, ma'am. That my cursor's on? And, and who was Lieutenant Benavides? Um, he was our day shift lieutenant at the time. Was he a supervisor? Yes, ma'am. is that that we're hearing? Lieutenant Benavides. Thank you. 
So what is your understanding about where Ms. Hutchins is being taken now? Um, into the back of the ambulance. And can you explain why is she going into the back of an ambulance rather than the helicopter? The helicopter hasn't arrived yet. And my understanding is that they have additional medicines and um, equipment and measures they can take inside of an ambulance. All right, thank you. What did you just say? I asked the ETA in the helicopter. And who are you speaking to? Uh, Santa Fe Dispatch. Do you recall how they responded? It's been a minute since I watched this video, so. All right. Oh, we got the bird right here. Is the helicopter now arriving? Yes, ma'am. Well, what are you doing now? Um, appears I'm grabbing crime scene tape. Why are you grabbing crime scene tape? Um, to start the crime scene. I don't know if anybody had told me to grab the tape yet, but I knew we needed to start one. So. You felt that you needed to put up crime scene, t crime scene tape. Yes, ma'am. Or someone may have asked for it. What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, or someone may have someone may have asked asked me for it. I'm just not too sure. Okay. And what's crime scene tape used for? To mark the perimeter, or the inner perimeter of essentially what, a crime scene, which they want to tape off and only allow certain people in and out. Okay. And was that an issue in this scene? The crime scene? Well, cordoning off the crime scene, was that an issue here? Yeah, it's, it's, it was a, a unique situation because of the, uh, you can't really tie crime scene tape to nothing. So we had to, I think at one point they actually used our patrol units as to tie the tape around and go to the next one. And why is it important to cordon that off? Um, just for evident, evidence purposes, um, and allow only certain people in and out, because at this point we didn't know what was going on. So. A and w were there uh, people in that area that were not first responders? Yes. Approximately how many, if you recall? I don't know. I couldn't give you a number, really. There was just a lot of people on the outside. Um, that I hadn't seen originally inside the church, so. Okay, and did you know who those people were? No. Okay. person here in the gray shirt? Yes, ma'am. Was that a first responder? No. So when the crime scene tape goes up, what happens to that person? Uh, I can't recall. Well, I haven't watched the video yet. Hypothetically, is that person allowed to stay inside the crime scene? No. Okay. Who are the people that are allowed to stay inside the tape? Um, medical and for first responders. Okay. This is in the middle of a shot, and I have live ordinance 
on the ceiling up there. It's safe. Okay. But it is here, right above here. Okay. Right there. That's okay. And if you get to the point where you say you want me to move, all right. Uh, home my Okay. Where's the bird? It's right here. Okay. Yeah, what are you doing now? Um, I talked with the paramedics inside the ambulance, and they asked me where the helicopter was. I told him it was landing, and he asked them to bring the the paramedics to them. So you're bringing the paramedic from the helicopter to the ambulance? Yes. All right. Approximately 23 year old female in the back of the ambulance right now. Gunshot underneath the right arm. Went through all the way to the back left. Can we carry this back for you, sir? I got it. You got it? Everybody who's on scene, okay? What are you doing now? Um, just trying to think what's next. Um, I think I'm putting the pilot, one of the pilots' um, head headgear inside the ambulance on the other side of the door. Why are you telling those people to move? Um, just to start to gather people up because they're just standing around the uh, the church where the said incident happened. Why didn't you do that when you initially got there? Um, just went, went in and um, made sure that medical, uh, that people were receiving medical treatment and then slowly go with the, go with the flow, see what, what it could do next. It is, are, are you trained to take action to save lives before moving witnesses around? Yes, ma'am. Taking this one. Is the bird in? Is she going the bird? No, not yet. They're, 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 they did an IVs, get an IO, and then they're going to take in the bird. They're coming out like a thousand. They're moving in from this one? Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of them still. And whose jack is that? Joel's. Joel's? Okay. It's got his phone. Hey, oh, be careful. It is bloody. Okay. It's got his phone. It's got his other stuff in it. Okay, well, we're going to just keep it here. So, he was... Is it his phone? 
Officer LaFleur, uh, this woman who, who's speaking right now, she's not a police officer, right? No. Um, was she employed with the uh, fire department? No, she was their set medic, I'm guessing. When you say set medic, do you mean she's the medic on the movie set? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he was wearing it. Why? Where's his phone at? Uh, I don't know. Do you have any idea why movie sets would have medic, me medical personnel on scene? Um, it's probably for safety reasons. Someone closer than the paramedics or fire department. For safety reasons? Yeah. Phone. Anybody have your yeah. All right, gentlemen. Um, I just need your IDs, and then have you guys step outside and wait for the investigators to get here. Okay? Okay, cool. Any idea who these guys are? Just more uh, people involved with the movie set. Movie set employees? Yeah. Is that your impression? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And who's the props guy? Who's in charge of props? She has green and purple hair. You can't miss her. Okay. I was here when it happened. You were here when it happened? Yes, Who else was here when it happened? Uh, 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 the camera operator. How many people do you think were in here when it happened? Uh, three, maybe four. Four? Maybe. Okay. So two more other than you two? Reed, as soon as I see him. He Reed, camera operator. Reed, yes, sir. Okay, who else? Reed Russell was here. Uh, Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin was the actor on set that pulled the trigger. Alec Baldwin? Yes, sir. Where's he at? We got one. Yeah, you have a unit find him? Yes, sir. Okay. How's it going, sir? Um, so, I, my understanding, um, you, were, you were in the room when the lady, when someone I was, was shot? holding the gun, yeah. Okay, alrighty. Um, what do you need? Well, I, I know your name, so it, it's, it's, uh, um, Jenny. Pursuant to the uh, stipulation, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, jump ahead. Very good. I want to make sure this is the right part. Okay. Let me get with my lieutenant and see, see where we want right. you to where we want you to hang out. Okay. Uh, whatever you want to do. Yes, sir. All right. Give me just a second. So I got. So apparently I was not given the appropriate reaction. You want me to jump ahead five seconds now? What? I need to know what to do, or I just press play. What, what do I do? You want me to have him sit tight or? Yeah, he's gonna have to sit tight. Sit tight and you I have the armor in here. This is all their stuff. I have the, the gun used is in there. And I got the two people that were in the room. Okay. You may have Alec Baldwin take a seat in the back of my unit or? Um, no, I, we know where he's at. We know who he is. Yeah. We just need to say, is he in a trailer? No, he's right there in the gray and black. Okay. All right. So. Try to keep him away from everybody. Okay. Have him talk to anybody. Okay. I can just have him sit. I can sit with him in my unit. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Officer Lafleur, at this point in time, what's your intention? I was going to go back to where uh, Mr. Baldwin was, and then escort him to my unit. When I got there, I realized 
my unit is over here being used as a post for the crime scene. So what did you do when you realized that? Um, just had him sit where he was and had everybody just hang out there. Started writing out people's names. Um, okay. Seems like they're talking about what happened. Now, as a law enforcement officer, is that something that concerns you? Uh, yes. And why? Why? Why does that concern you? Um, they could be. Um, one person could be telling them what they saw, and mess up what they have to say what they saw. So it could essentially. Um, um, coerced testimony, I guess. People would say the same thing because the other person said it, rather okay. than saying their own their own opinion, their own view of what they saw. Okay. Mr. Baldwin, um, who's the director on scene? The guy that was shot. The, the, the guy that was shot. He's in the okay. Where is he now? Um, I think he's in the end. Do you guys have a, a production car? Or? There's an AD. Day, right okay. I'm happy to stay right here and do everything that he's doing. Well, I, my, my lieutenant just wants you to, to stay away from everybody and not to talk to nobody. So, um, I, I was, wait right here. You, we can wait right here and have everybody step back, or we can wait in the back of my patrolling, but I prefer right to not right put you there, okay? So, why did you let Mr. Baldwin sit there instead of putting him in some vehicle and separating him from the other witnesses? Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, my unit was clear across being used as a uh, post, and just because I didn't know what we had right there, came to maintain cooperation with people involved. Well, it sounds like you gave him an option. You let him choose. Is that right? Um, yeah, he wanted to stay right there, and figured if I could keep him there, um, I didn't see a big problem with it until uh, later on when people were talking and whatnot. And did, did you give uh, Mr. Baldwin instructions about whether or not he could speak to people? I did tell him to stop talking. Um, and did you give instructions to the other witnesses that were around? Um, I didn't tell, tell them, um, but I told them he had to sit there and um, not talk to nobody. Okay. I got a big one. What do you got? You got medium? <laughs> yes, sir. Right, I'm right there. Silver car is Alex's vehicle. If you want to put him in there. Maybe Mr. Baldwin, is that your car? Yeah. yeah we can wait in there. Here. We can wait in your car be, if you if you want to. I can't smoke in the car. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we can wait. Hang out right here then. Is Joe gone? They both gone? They're, they, uh, well, they're still working on the female. Uh, if you, you haven't seen the helicopter take off, then they're not gone yet. If you know Officer Lafleur, why hadn't the helicopter taken off yet? I don't know exactly why, but my guess is they have to stabilize the patient before they can put them in, in the air. In the air, okay. Just stand in there. Just standing with Mr. Baldwin, allowing him to smoke a cigarette, making and, and sure. And why is it important for you to be standing there? 
Um, essentially, he's detained, not free to leave. Um, so I'm there with him. Why do you have these these two gentlemen uh, standing over there that we can see? What what is there something important about them? Um, the guy in the gray was I had him stand over there because he was inside the room when I had first got at the uh, the church, and um, the other guy in the brown uh, apparently was in the in the church too. So I just wanted everybody who was in the church in one area so we could be easily be found. So, you wanted everyone that was in the church in one area? Yes, ma'am. And are we looking at that area? Um, to the left of Baldwin is where the majority of everybody was, yes. Okay. And those were the witnesses that were in the church? From what I was told, yes. Okay. So, Mr. Baldwin, um, how many people were in the room when it happened? It's a group. It's a group. It doesn't mean that a lot of crews outside the inside that building are small. It doesn't mean Okay. He's the one that knows what it is. He's asking how many people were in the room at the time. How's it going, sir? Deputy LaFleur. Um, how many people were in the room at the, at the time? Six? Six? Officer LaFleur, who's this gentleman who's speaking now in the blue jean shirt? Um, from what I was told, he was on one of the other directors. Six or seven, I need to uh, definitely answer the right. I don't know. here, the two that were injured, that makes three, and then these two gentlemen, four or five, um, so who, who would be the other two? Person in the jean shirt was a what was inside the church and witnessed the incident. Uh, I do not know. Okay, why don't you come on over to the back of Does it appear to you that Mr. Baldwin is speaking to the other witnesses? Um, I think he was talking about who was, who would have the, who would know who's in the room. Okay. I can't really hear it. Um, and then the, apparently the guy's son was working there as well. Okay. Um, is this an ideal way to separate someone from witnesses? After looking at it, probably not, but this is what happened. Okay, understood. You arrived at the door? Do you have an idea on you, sir? So right now, her, 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 her status is questionable. That's why we called the air, air light. But where were you at, sir? I was right behind him. Right behind him? Okay. Yeah, I was right behind him right when it happened. All right. 
So just have you guys hang out for me right here. Um, we'll get someone to get your statement in a second, okay? And then we cleared, they cleared the gun outside after yeah, on his request, and I witnessed them clear it and saw the bullets. Okay. So the only one was, yeah, they were all proper. The one that was missing, the one that fired, we don't know, but all the other ones were proper. Um, they had loads. Officer LaFleur, uh, does it seem to you right now that they're talking about the incident? It seems like they're talking about the gun that was used in the incident. All right. Officer, do you know what this conversation is about that we're watching right here? Something about a shake test. I don't know. Maybe uh, the rounds, dummy rounds, maybe. Okay. I'm not too entirely sure. Do you agree with me that, well, was Mr. Baldwin supposed to be talking about the incident? <coughs> no, ma'am. Does he appear to be doing it anyway? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Is there a reason that you didn't stop them since you told them not to? I think uh, as time goes on, I tell them to stop. Okay. You were in the room? Okay. Can you get your ID, sir? You see this gentleman over here on the left? Yes, ma'am. Any reason to believe he was inside the room at the time? Yeah, I'm not sure at this point. Okay. Were you in the room too, ma'am? Yes. Okay. trying to stabilize her vital signs enough for the, the flight sure. and, and administer any kind of nar uh, narcotics or anything they need, blood thinners and that may be, then they'll load her up in the, in the helicopter and they'll flight her there. I believe the other ambulance is on the other side um, and he seems to be doing better than she was, so Absolutely. they might drive him in an ambulance. Okay. I heard him wave off the other car, so... St. Vincent's. They're both trauma ones. So. Thanks for 
the information. I'm curious. Yes, ma'am. Officer LaFleur, have more first responders now arrived? Um, off to your, oh, off to your right you can see, there it is, off to your right you can see uh, <coughs> more patrol units showing up, um, this deputy showed up, but uh, this corporal had been there for a minute. And approximately how long have you now been on scene? Um, according to my body cam, a little over 25 minutes. Okay. Hey, Corporal. I got uh, seven people there in the room when it happened, all their IDs, so. Okay. Just uh, get it all brought that down. I'm not sure what the CID put out there. It's okay. At that point in time, what was your understanding of how many people were in the room and witnessed it? Uh, I believe I said seven. Okay. Do you know whether or not that turned out to be true? Um, I think there was actually more. Mm -hmm. I wrote all the people who said that were, they were in the room uh, in my report. Okay. Hey, sir. Okay. Um, and I'm just hanging out with him because yeah, he's the one who pulled the trigger. Okay. Yeah, he, he tried it. Sorry, I didn't. I was <laughs> trying to set things up a while ago. And... Notepad, ready? All right. Do you have a notepad? Officer Lafleur, at this point in time, I, I know he's no longer in the frame, but the gentleman in the in the blue denim shirt. Do you know whether or not he was in the room at the time? Um, I don't recall if he was in the room or not. Okay. I know there was some director or whatnot there. Okay. Yeah, I don't have mine either. Yeah. Playing start. Yeah, I know. It came off when I was given uh, trying to pack uh, wounds. Yeah. Okay. Officer LaFleur, does it look like Mr. Baldwin is speaking to a potential witness? He just looks like he's talking to the guy who says his name is the, one of the directors, yes. Okay. Um, is that what you had in mind when you asked Mr. Baldwin not to speak to anyone? No. Do you know what they're talking about? I couldn't hear what they were talking about. Uh, I did hear him ask him what cigarettes he was smoking and if he could have one. So. Thank 
All right. Or do you want to just try some pages on? No, because I'm going to be writing quite a bit. Everybody's in the room. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm a phone on me. <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, right yeah, now? I'll write it down. Do you see the gentleman in the denim shirt gesturing? You want me to back up? Yeah, which one? Are we talking about this gentleman? Yeah. Do you, do you know what he's gesturing? No, it looks like he picks up his hand. <laughs> now that you... Now that you play it back, it looks like he's shaking his hand. And, and had you seen him do that previously? No, not until just now. I thought you testified earlier about a shake test. That the gentleman was talking about a shake test. Okay. But I have not seen the director do it until reviewing the footage now. Okay. <coughs> My eyes aren't always exactly where the body cam is pointed, so. Absolutely. Um, when you tell people not to talk about the incident, do you have an expectation that they'll follow your instructions? Yes, ma'am. Does it look like they're following your instructions? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, Officer LaFleur, I'm going to stop the video there. Uh, what, what else did you do on scene that day? Um, I helped um, essentially just wait with uh, other witnesses, I guess, or people that wanted to give a statement or they needed a statement from at a different location. It was their base camp is what they called it. So you needed to take statements from people that were at another location, is that what you said? No, we took people from where was essentially where we had them, and they took them down to their base camp, um, and that's where they started interviews. And the, the people that you take to base camp, are those the same people that we see here in the video? I believe so, those people and... Um, I don't know how many people they ended up interviewing. Um, did uh, did at any point in time did Mr. Baldwin tell you that he didn't pull the trigger of the gun? I believe he told me he was holding the gun. Um, I believe in the beginning when I was leaving the church, one of the guys said that Baldwin had pulled the trigger. Um, so just off of what was told. And I know that this sounds ridiculous, but we have to follow some jurisdictional rules. Do you see Mr. Baldwin in this uh, frame here? Yes, ma'am. Would you point him out, please? And do you see that same gentleman in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. And would you point him out, please? Uh, he's sitting at the, in the middle with the um, glasses. Okay. Anything else that you did um, of import that you can think of that you think the jury should hear about? I think that's about it. How long were you on scene, if you recall? Um, from when I got there, it was, I don't know, about 10 hours maybe or so. I was there until dark. You were there for 10 hours? Yeah, until they were done interviewing people. Is that typical? Um... It is if that's what they need to be done, so. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, just for the record, uh, we would ask that the record reflect that uh, uh, Officer LaFleur has identified the defendant. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Gotcha. <clears throat> Sorry, Mr. Spider. Oh, sorry. Get that out of your way. I may have to interrupt your question. It's always fine when the court interrupts me.
Then may I proceed? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, um, When you got to the scene, Mr. Baldwin um, walked up to you and said, I-, I was holding a gun. He blurted it out, right? Yes. And, in fact, you, he was very shocked, very, if you could picture Alec Baldwin in a pale state, you know, very unsure of himself. You could say an actor out of character. Fair? Sure. Object to the formal question. It, it, it is Mr. Spiro testifying in the we question. Are not okay. The May we approach? When you saw Mr. Baldwin, he looked very shocked. If you could picture Mr. Baldwin in a pale state, you know, like unsure of himself, you could say an actor out of character. Is that a fair description? Sure. And he said to you, I'm here, whatever you want to do, right? Yes. He said to you at one point, where should I go, right? Yes. And he also pointed out to you who the director was on scene who was hit in the shoulder, right? I believe so. He asked and inquired about him. And he also asked you how she was doing, right? Meaning Miss Hutchins, right? Yes. I don't remember you being asked about that on direct, were you? And you mean asked by that by the state? Yeah. Objection relevance? Overruled. So I want to take a step back. The dispatch that came over to your radio, sir, before you got to the scene was a dispatch for an accidental shooting by a prop gun, correct? I believe that's what was told to me, yes. Okay. And you've testified to that previously, right? Yes. Okay. And the dispatch um, report, you know, you know that you re- received that, that wording, accidental discharge, several times, right? I believe so. Okay. So I want to ask you... I want to ask you, how come when you described it today in court, how come you didn't include the word accident when you testified before this jury? I'm not one to say if it was an accident or not. Just there to initially respond to it, and then the detectives determine not whether or not it was an accident. Well, sure, but every other time you've been asked about this, you've said it was an accident. And now today at the trial of Alec Baldwin, when you're talking to this jury, you left that word out. Isn't that true? Not intentionally, no. Did you meet with the prosecutors before you testified here today? Just briefly in, in the room outside. For them to tell me who, who was in order or what witness. You've discussed your testimony previously with Ms. Morrissey, correct? Before today? Um, just in a pre-trial interview, yes. We've talked about your lapel that was on. It's true, right, that the lapel is actually mandatory. Yes. Right? And so they came to the officers, passed a law, and told you you had to wear your lapel, right? Yes. And the way it works is it proceed, it, it secures all of these statements, and when you're done wearing it for the day, you go back to the station, you log it in, and, there's, and then it exists, right? Essentially, yeah, but it, it's more complex than that. It uploads on itself. Oh, it self-uploads so that it maintains itself? Yes. Okay. And we then t- you then talked a little bit about um, the security of the scene. Um, and you talked about crime scene tape going up, right? Yes. But it, as you just told this jury, you know, at the time, you don't know whether this is an accident or not, right? Yes. It's not like a crime scene tape it is some evidence of a crime, right? And whether it was an accident or a crime, a crime scene is still essential. And you've been very candid that you've made, you made some mistakes at the scene, right? Yes. And that you've learned since then about some of these mistakes, right? Yes. You've said hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yes. And you know you can Monday morning quarterback decisions, but you made them in the field, right? Yes. Okay. 
And you've said that based on your training and experience, you know that if witnesses are left to speak to each other, they can taint each other's memories, right? Yes. And sometimes that's incidental and accidental, right? Yes. And sometimes it's purposeful, right? Depends on who's there, yes. Well, if you were with somebody and somebody was talking to you about the 911 call, right, and they kept saying to you over and over, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't an accident, and then you testify and you leave out the word accident, that could be an example of pain, couldn't it? Sure. And also, non witnesses contain people's memories too. You agree with me? I guess. Well, you know, at one point in your testimony previously, you had said, that there was a lawyer on the scene that was talking to some of the people that were on the scene. I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, and if that lawyer told somebody on the scene, I think your understanding is that could have tainted their, their view of their memory, right? Essentially, yes. Mr. Baldwin never asked to speak to that lawyer, did he? I, not to my recollection. And, you know, then you went on and you said, you know, it, that... You had told Mr. Baldwin not to speak to the other witnesses. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. And I think you were asked approximately five times why Mr. Baldwin was disobeying your orders. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Okay. But in the lapel video that we just saw, you're not going up to Mr. Baldwin and, and, or these witnesses going, get, get out of here. Get out of here. I'm an officer. You've got to separate. You don't do that, right? No. Nope. And also in that video, you can see a lot of these people are coming over to Mr. Baldwin, right? Yes. One of them comes over and shakes his hand, right? Yes. Have you ever seen that in all of your experience? Somebody commit a homicide and everybody and all the witnesses are on the scene, circling around the person, shaking his hand and talking to him about what happened. Have you ever seen that in your entire career? No. And then you went on to say, well, you didn't put him in the cruiser. You didn't put him in the cruiser um, because your cruiser was being used. Was was I guess the reason that you gave was that? Did I understand that right? My patrol unit was being actively used as a post on the other side of the field for a crime scene. When you say a post, you mean like it, it goes somewhere else and you put the tape around it? Is that the side mirror was wrapped around with crime scene tape? Uh huh. You mean there were also another dozen officers? on the scene that, that day that had police cars that they wanted to put Mr. Baldwin in at any point, right? Yep. Okay. And um, in fact, Mr. Baldwin later on drives himself to the precinct and goes and speaks to the police, right? I'm not too sure how he got there, but he did get there. Well, he wasn't under arrest, right? Not to my knowledge, no. And so you use this word detained. When, when Ms. Morrissey asked you, well, was, were you detaining Mr. Baldwin? Do you remember that question? Yes. Isn't it true that even today, years later, no police officer has ever represent, rep, arrested Mr. Baldwin or detained him in a police car? True? I don't know. The police department, the Santa Fe Police Department, has never arrested Mr. Baldwin. Not the Get Santa Fe the Police Department. Question asked and answered. Overruled. And one of the things that you do as an officer on the scene is you observe demeanor, right? Yes. And you spent 10 hours on the scene, I think I heard you say, right? Yes. You got to see the people of Rust that day live, right? Yes. And the truth of the matter is <clears throat> that you took it as a way how everybody was acting and that the individual who claimed to have been holding the firearm was still there, that there was no... The way he was, his demeanor was that there was there wasn't any intention behind the act, as you could say. Isn't that true? I wouldn't say there was no intention. I don't know the individual's intentions, but his demeanor was sad, um, upset. Okay, well, it's not just his demeanor being sad and upset, right? Okay, we'll move that to the side. And I understand you're not a mind reader, right? Correct? Yes. Okay. All you can do is look at the people and look at how they're interacting and make your own judgments, right? Yes. Okay, and you do that as a police officer to try to figure out how to interact with the scene. True? Yes. Okay, and, and, and isn't it true 
that the way you took it, how everybody was acting and that the individual who claimed to have been holding the firearm was still there, that there was no, the way he was, his demeanor was that there wasn't any intention behind the act, as you could say. Isn't that true? Again, the wording you're using, I wouldn't say okay. I had any clue of whose intention was what, but he was sad and upset. Okay, well, let's play. I'm going to play his statement to that effect. Can we peel that up, please? If that's okay with the court. He's saying he, did, he, he didn't say that he did. I'm going to impeach him. I don't think he said he didn't. Say. He well, do you want me to clarify that? Yeah. Okay. Are you claiming that you didn't say that? Re rephrase what you said? Sure. Dispatch said it was an accidental shooting by a prop gun. So I, I didn't know if there was any. I took it as the way how everybody was acting and that the individual who claimed to have been holding the firearm was still there, that there was no, the way he was, his demeanor was that there was, wasn't any intention behind the, the act, as you could say, you know. Again, I wouldn't say I knew what his intention was. I understand that. What I'm asking you now Okay. is did you, in fact, say those words that I just asked you? At what time? The Gutierrez or PTI? Yes. I may have. Okay. You don't deny saying that. Here, let's no. if we can. One more time, I'm just going to ask you, did you say that statement that I read? If you're reading the statement and it says my name next to it, then I'm more likely said it. I just don't recall when. And one of the other things um, that happened that day that, that I don't think we've talked about is um, you, you, you spoke to a witness who told you that um, a woman named Sarah was crying and shaking and going through the bullets and saying, I don't know how it got in there. Objection, hearsay. I'm asking the, the witness if, if he had that information. He's that he's making the statement, the hearsay statement is coming in. Do, do, do you know whether anybody at the scene was, um, before you got there, um, shaking and going through the bullets and saying, I don't know how it got in there? I don't know. Okay. If we could refresh the witness with his lapel, um, and I would ask if you just, can I put it up on just his screen? Sure. Okay. I don't think you can do that. I would object because that's not proper refreshment. We don't refresh in front of the jurors. That's my objection. What, what do you mean? Well, if we're refreshing... We're going to take a lunch break real quick, and we're going to be back at 1 o'clock, okay? Please don't talk among yourselves. I'm going to ask you to I will rise to the jury. Excused, you can move over, and this thing is a battery and council approach. 